Okay, first of all, welcome everyone um, to our BCCBE seminars. Could you please join me in Gosho as we begin today? Now want me doubts. Now want me doubts on my doubts. Today, I'm very grateful for our speaker, Reverend Dr. Mutsumi Wondra. I know she's very busy, but she agreed to speak to us today for this seminar. Let me give you a short introduction on Wondra Sensei. She's been a resident minister of Orange County Buddhist Temple since 2015. She was born and raised in Kyoto, Japan, where she graduated from Kyoto Women's University. She then went to complete the coursework at Chuobukyo Gakuin. Following this, she received her MA from the Institute of Buddhist Studies. Then she moved back to Kyoto for a while and received her MA and PhD from Ryukoku University and also her Honganji academic rank of Hokkyo. Besides serving at the Orange County Buddhist Temple, she's also a professor at IBS. So as you can see, she's a very busy person. So thank you for sharing in your knowledge today for this seminar, Women and Jodo Shinshu. So I would like to now turn over the time to Wondra Sensei. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Thank you very much, Hirano Sensei, for uh, introducing me. I am Mutsumi Wondra. Good morning, everyone. It's so very nice to see you today. Um, when Hirano Sensei uh, approached me and they gave me a wonderful opportunity to talk about women in Jodo Shinshu, I was so excited. And, you know, what can I say? I can't. Is it coming from Hirano Sensei? So, of course, I said, I'm delighted. So, today is a, I will talk about women, particularly in Shinshu, that means Jodo Shinshu. Another word is a Shin Buddhist woman. Uh, actually, is a theme of the woman in Buddhism or woman and Buddhism is one of my uh, uh, academic research themes, particularly that uh, Shin Buddhist woman uh, talking about a Shinisama, Kaku Shinisama, that's a daughter, and then also Lady Takeko Kujo, who was made a uh, Buddhist Women's Association. Those are my one of that uh, research area. So I'm very happy to share uh, with you and then talking about those women. Uh, before I got into my PowerPoint, I want to say that uh, today is, uh, they gave me the plenty of time, but I'm not gonna talk so much. I understand that it's, it's Zoom is not, easy to follow, so I try to talk and stop talking about in maybe 70 minutes or so, so we can open up a question and also a, a free discussion. So uh, I will talk very slowly and then, you know, the not academic uh, uh, perspective and make sure everybody uh, understand and enjoy my talk. All right, so let me share my PowerPoint. Somehow it doesn't go, so let me go back, all the way back, sorry. <laughs> Technical area is really sometimes a challenge, isn't it? Anyway, so... Um, this is my title, Women in Jodo Shinshu. Sometimes it's called Jodo Shinshu Shinshu, Shinshu. 
or maybe Buddhist woman, I uh, assume Buddhist woman uh, means Buddhist uh, women in Jodo Shinshu. So, um, you know, when you think about I'm a Buddhist woman and a Shin Buddhist woman, right? And I see a lot of people. Thank you for coming today and uh, for this session. Uh, those are all uh, Shin Buddhist women, I believe, in Buddhist women. So many, many women. I think women roles in the history of Buddhism, or particularly Jodo Shinshu, are very vital. Very vital. That's what I'm talking today. And then uh, when you look around, as I say, I'm a Buddhist woman, and then you're a Buddhist woman, Shin Buddhist woman, right? And when you go to the temple, you will see a lot of Buddhist women, don't you? And a Shin Buddhist woman in your Sangha. So, for example, my personal, this is my mother. My mother was born in Kyoto. I was born in Kyoto, too. So uh, she was a very devout Shin Buddhist woman. She and I uh, luckily and graduated from the Kyoto uh, Women's University and junior high and senior high together. Uh, that was established by the lady Takeko Kujo. So uh, I'm only one child. I'm one daughter. And then my parents allowed me to marry an American, <laughs> and I came to the United States, 1981. You can count already, quickly, how old I am now. <laughs> uh, but long story, I'll make it short, is a, um, so after I came here, I get settled, probably about nine years or so, my mom got diagnosed with cancer. So I was told Maybe she will last about five years. That was very shocking. So eventually, she passed away at the age of 58. That was shocking to me. I lost my mother. I felt like I lost my best friend. I lost my best girlfriend. We are very close, even when we are far away. So. I missed her so much, but her death opened me and woke me up, uh, gave me a kind of awakening call. What is your life? Why were you born? <laughs> I noticed it. I thought my mother lived forever for me. That's not right. Everything was just, you know, I thought, Huh? That was not right. So I started saying, I think I better study Buddhism, very basic. So I started studying in the correspondence course in Chiyobu Kyogakuin, or you can take that uh, JSCC and Jodo Shinshu correspondence course. That's my starting time. So even when I went to Kyoto Women, and I know that every week we went to Monday or Tuesday morning uh, Sunday service or Tuesday service and morning service, I knew that I was sitting in the hondo. I put our hands together. We were all reciting Namami Dabutsu. But the message went through ear to ear. I didn't remember anything. But all of a sudden, my mother hit me. Her death hit me. And then gave me a great opportunity to study Buddhism and Jodo Shinshu, Shinran's teaching. So I lost her mother, but I thought she gave me a tremendous joy to invite me to this path. So I really appreciate my mother. So she is also a Shin Buddhist woman. So today, I just do probably a bit to tell you uh, the contents, my flow, so you follow me and easy. First of all, let me talk about my temple, OCBC, Orange County Buddhist Church. OCBC is located in Southern California 
near the Disneyland. Okay? So when you come to Disneyland, come to us. We are open Sunday service. September we will resume again. Every Sunday we have a Sunday service. Full blown. No restriction. We can accommodate 300 people with Hondo. Okay? Please come. And then also I will introduce VBT, Vista Buddhist Temple, BWA, because we have been taking care of the Vista Temple. And then also, uh, I just want to talk briefly about women's status in ancient India and the women's first ordination and the women in Mahayana Pyoran Buddhism. And then go into Japanese Pyoran Buddhism, Honen Shonin, Shinran Shonin's teacher, right? And then Honen Shonin's understanding of view of women's Buddhahood. And then Shinran Shonin, our founder's view on women's Buddhahood. And then Ishinisama is Shinran Shonin's wife. And then her letter, and then their daughter, Kakushini Samas, as a caretaker of Honganji. And Lady Takeko Kujo as a founder of Buddhist Women's Association. And then I want to talk about awakening of a contemporary Shin Buddhist woman. Those are the flow I will talk today. So first of all, this is the, the picture of uh, my temple, Orange County Buddhist Church, B. W A uh, cabinet members. We have a cabinet installation every two years. We did it last year, and then we currently we have about a little bit over hundred members, and they are very very active. Uh, particularly the cabinet members lining up right here, wearing the purple dress a little bit. Those are the uniform. So um, we do a, a Shinni-sama memorial service, Kaku Shinni-sama memorial service. And then also the February, Kisara Giki, we call it, a memory of uh, Lady Takeko Kujo. And then we started uh, Women in Buddhism uh, local seminars as well. Those women are very active doing that fundraising activities, of course, we are, they are waiting to make a uh, obento sale in September. <laughs> Lot of idea, Tupperware, <laughs> craft sales, many, many things. And then they also support a uh, OCBC. Uh, those are the backbone ladies. Not only working in the kitchen, they are also very active on campus as well. They totally support a financial support to uh, Boy Scout, Girl Scout, wonderful woman. It's all the, they always show like a compassion and loving care. When the member got sick, fell in a hospital, they always send the flowers, they always send the card. Sometimes they call. I call too, right? So they, we care each other. That's a wonderful BWA ladies. And this picture is, as I said, is Vista Temple uh, BWA members. Vista Temple is located on the way to San Diego. We always go once a month. I go there and share the Buddha Dharma on Sunday service. It's a wonderful temple, Vista Temple. Nice location, very quiet, and good listeners. So I really appreciate all the Vista Temple members, and they welcome me. And then BWA ladies are very powerful too. So I just say only OCBC or Vista, but I'm sure there's a lot of BWA association and organizations and all over the United States. So they're all members a Buddhist woman and then she's a Buddhist woman, right? So as I said, is 
just briefly talking about before I got into the women in Shin Buddhism or uh, sh um, Jodo Shinshu, I just want to share a little bit about the women's status in ancient India and then also the women's first ordination. Some of the people already know this, but the word is Gosho Sanju. I will explain to you the term Gosho, Go is five, and Sho is a Sawari, hindrances. So Gosho means five hindrances that a woman cannot become. That's not fair, don't you think? But again, don't get offended because I'm talking about ancient India situation more than 2,000 years ago and in Shakyamuni time, 2,500, 2,600 years ago. So five hindrances, what are they? Number one is women cannot be Burham God. Women cannot be a Indra, that means Lord of the Divas. Women cannot be a, a Chakravartin, it's a great wheel rolling king. And then women cannot be a king of a demon, or women cannot be a Buddha. That's the most important thing. That means women cannot be awakened. Those are the five kind of hindrances hurdles, areas women had in ancient India. And let me move on to another word, Sanju. San is three. Ju is follow. So that means uh, women f has to follow three men who are her father, husband, and sons. Again, don't get offended. I understand when I was a <laughs> young, I don't think I follow my <laughs> father all the time. Of course, my husband and I are equal. I don't follow him all the time, <laughs> right? So, because, think about it, at that time, women in India, they are totally you know, um, difficult time to find a job, cannot make a money. You know, that means, I'm talking about the woman's inability of economic. So that means she has to totally depend on father, husband, or son to live everyday life, economically. That was a situation. So that really expresses the inability of women's economic interdependency, right? And there is some triangle here. Those are the famous Indian caste system. Caste system is all the man's world. Women is not in that picture either. So the top is Burham, is priest, right? Academic area. And the Kushatoria is warrior or kings. Well, actually, it's Chakyamuni Buddha, uh, is a Siddhartha uh, family belong to this uh, Kushatoria. And then Vaisha is more merchants. And then Shudra is sort of like a servants, a uh, commoner, uh, 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 peasants. Those are things. And underneath is untouchable area. So those are the Indian caste system. So I was just talked about at that time as the old and ancient Indian society system and women's situation. Okay? That's for your knowledge before getting to a Jodo Shinshu woman. Okay? Talking about a woman's first ordination. There is a story, right? I'm sure there's a lot of people know already. Uh, Mahabajapati. That's pronunciation a little difficult. <laughs> Mahabajapati. Mahabajapati is a Chikamani, um, that means um, uh, Siddhartha's, a mother-in-law, right? It's a real mother is Maya. Maya, Lady Maya, 
passed away after having the baby uh, Siddhartha, you remember? And then uh, Maya's sister, uh, her name is Mahabhajapati, came and then started taking care of a, a baby uh, um, Siddhartha. So after uh, Siddhartha left the castle, leaving uh, uh, Yashodara wife, and then also a uh, baby, uh, you know, uh, and then he started going through a aesthetic uh, practice path. So she, after that was 29 years old, and then after six years, he finally got enlightened under the Sarah tree, right? Bodhi tree, and then he had a Sangha as a Shakyamuni Buddha had his own Sangha. The Sangha consisted of all male. So, uh, Bhikkhu, Bhikkhu. Yeah? So, uh, a lot of women was very concerned. How about us? Not fair. I want to be getting to the Sangha. So the first woman is knocked the door is the Shakyamuni Buddha's mother-in-law, you know? Her name is Mahapajapati. Mahapajapati asked the Shakyamuni Buddha, as Shakyamuni, I am very, very interested in pursuing your teaching. Please allow me to get into your Sangha. Buddha said, sorry, I can't accept you. Sorry, I can't accept you. Three times, no. Mm. This is a custom to ask three times, not only one time, three times. So one day, Mahapajabati was standing, and then Ananda found her. Hey, what, what are you doing standing here? So Mahapajabati said, you know, I was refused by Shakyamuni, and then he said, I cannot get in his uh, uh, Sangha. So Ananda said, really? Let me talk to him. So the Ananda asked him, Shakyamuni, again, three times, Sh shall we please reconsider? He said, no, no, no. But Ananda said, you know, honored one, think about it. After your real mother passed away, Mahavajabati stepped into, and you, she took care of you, sort of. She hugged you, she gave you milk, she gave you food, maybe she j changed the diaper, everything. Think about it. Don't you owe her a lot? So finally, Shakyamuni said, okay, I understand. I will allow her to come to my Sangha. That's what happened. So again, I want to make sure that Shakyamuni didn't have any doubt about women's ability to get enlightened or to receive a Buddhahood. That was no problem. Shakyamuni said, men and women are equal. Women doesn't have any problem to receive and attain the Buddhahood. The reason why he refused probably according to scholar, because his sangha was not ready to accept the woman. So like, well, they didn't have a dome yet, right? The, the bhikkhu and bhikkhuni, and that means a male monk and then female monk, they cannot share the same dormitory together. They want to stay separately. So sort of like they, they have to build up the dome, they have to have a little bit different precept, right? So the other things, more like a, a logistic or a infrastructure, was not ready. So that was a reason, I think, and all, most of the scholars said, that's why that Shakyamuni refused. But again, it's after Mahabhajabati allowed to the Sangha, a lot of women came. Look at this picture. This is the Mahabhajabati. He said, thank you very much. 
Thank you for accepting me. And all the women look at him, all the lining up. And they are super happy to get able to get into Shakyamuni's Sangha. And this is another uh, the statue in India, actually. It's this Mahapajapati is uh, sitting under the Bodhi tree, I think. Okay, so this is the first uh, women ordination. After that, more and more women were able to go through ordination. Even Jodo Shinshu, I went through the Jodo Shinshu ordination, Tokudo in Kyoshi, and Kyoshi session is going on already today, I think, you know. A very exciting time. Women are allowed to do that. Without Mahapajabati, didn't get into, it's probably we would have difficult time. But she opened the door for all the women. Right? It's a wonderful story. So, next, I want to talk about a woman in Mahayana, Pyarana Buddhism. There is a Buddhism, is a Mahayana, big vehicle in Theravata Buddhism, small vehicle, while well, Jodo Shinshu belonged to Mahayana Buddhism. Everybody got into the same boat. I would say, always say, same school yellow bus. <laughs> Nobody's behind. Everybody get in. And everybody go to the same destination. Everybody. Nobody's behind. That's a Mahayana Buddhism and Pyodhana Buddhism. Pyodhana Buddhism is more like, this is based on uh, Amida Buddha's deep compassion, great uh, wisdom and compassion. So uh, I don't want to get into so doctrinal, but I want to just share the two important uh, Amida Buddha uh, uh, wishes. Uh, we call it Amida Buddha, but before becoming an Amida Buddha, uh, the Buddha had a name. Uh, Buddha was a Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is a student. Huh. Bodhisattva student. The student is pursue a uh, Buddha's teaching and practice. So Amida Buddha's Bodhisattva's name is Dharmakara Bodhisattva. Oh, Bodhisattva Dharmakara. Dharmakara, in other words, is a Hōzō Bosatsu. Hōzō. Zō is a storage. And storage is filled with Dharma. So Bodhisattva Dharmakara. So this Bodhisattva Dharmakara made a 48 vows. 48 vows means wishes. Okay, that's the narrative in larger Skavati Vyuha Sutra. Remember? When you read it, it's a wonderful story. Okay, so 18th vow we call it Hongan, primal vow. It's the most important thing in particularly Japanese Pure Land Buddhism, Honen's teaching and Shiran's teaching. So let me read what it says. If, when I attend the Buddhahood, hmm, the Seishan beings of the Ten Quarters, Ten Quarter is all universe. Huh. Ten Quarters, south and north and east and west, between the direction southwest, you know, um, northwest, and those eight directions, and plus up. And down. So that means signify ten direction means all universe. So all sentient be beings, living creatures, uh, in the ten directions, who with sincere and interesting mind and heart aspire to be born in my land, that means Bodhisattva Dharmakara, in Amida's land, and say my name. What is that? Nembutsu Namo Amidabutsu. 
even ten times, should not be born there, may I not attain the perfect enlightenment. Excluded those are those who commit the five grave offenses and those who slander the right Dharma. That's the 18th vow, and we call it Honggang, Prima vow, very important vow. So what they're saying is, okay, it's everything like, if I attain, when I attain the Buddhahood, this this thing, thing didn't happen, I wouldn't take a perfect enlightenment. That's how the phrase goes, all entire 48 vows. So in other words, when you twist it, when Buddha, uh, Bodhisattva Dharmakara become a Amida Buddha, which is attain the Buddhahood, all the sentient beings, 10 directions. If you say, and if you with the sincere and trusting heart and aspire, wish to be born in my land and say, Namamida Buddha 10 times, I'll guarantee you, and you will be attain the Buddhahood. In, born there in my land, for sure. That's what it says. But exclusion a little bit is this, if I start explaining this short t sentence though, but it takes a long time, but again is accept those five grave offenses and who slander the right Dharma. I know I might have to exclude. That's a kind of warning. Amida doesn't exclude anybody. That's your warning. Please do not do that. Please do not do a five grade offenses. For example, please do not kill your mother, father. Don't kill a heart. Don't hurt Buddha. And don't disturb a Buddhist Sangha, please. And slander Dhamma is criticized. It, the Buddha Dharma. Please do not do that. That's the warning. Okay? This is the 18th vow. Let's keep it in mind. So, in this, all sentient beings, that means women, men, all, everybody, even living creatures, animals, plants, everything, I think, sentient beings, you know, all get enlightened, all receive a Buddhahood, okay? However, in that a larger Skavati Buddha is a 35 vow, which is right here, is when I attain the Buddhahood, the woman threw out the countless and inconceivable Buddha world and the ten quarters, having heard my name, with rejoice in trusting heart, awaken the mind, aspiring for enlightenment, and wish to renounce the state of being woman. If after the end of lives, they should be reborn as woman, may I not attain the perfect enlightenment. It is a little confusing. I understand. <laughs> that means sort of woman has to renounce the state of woman. That means sort of like uh, transform the woman's form to male. That's what it says. That's 35 vow. Why is it? Why? Laja Sutra or Laja Skavati Buha Sutra says such thing, isn't it? This is the women's spiritual liberation. But 35 vow doesn't negate 100% woman has no luck at all. But it says, renounce the state of being woman. What does it mean? So there is a big debate in the history of Buddhism, 
uh, you know, uh, about the woman's uh, capability to attain the Buddhahood uh, by keeping a female form. You would think it is nonsensical topic now living in the gender equality society but however when we examine the rationale behind it may present the real meaning of gender equality i think okay so just briefly talking about 18th vowel 30th 35th vowel why we have 38 vowels Okay, well, keep in mind, and we can discuss about it later. Okay. So, um, let me get into that. The Honen Shonin. Honen Shonin, Shinran Shonin's um, teacher. Honen Shonin is the first Japanese Pure Land uh, teacher. Uh, he was born in 1133 and 1212. Easy to remember, <laughs> 1133, 1212, uh, the medieval time, uh, and then going through um, a Heian period, uh, medieval time, and then Kamakura uh, period. It's a drastic uh, time change. It's just aristocratic society to all the samurai coming up. It's very confusing, a political unrest all the time. So those are the time the uh, Honen Shonin uh, was born. And not only Honen Shonin, there are uh, several Buddhist school, like a Tendai, uh, Mantuhie by Saicho, and then Shingo Esoteric by Kukai, and then Soto, a Buddhist school that by Dogen, and then Linzai tradition from Eisai, and Nichiren school is Nichiren. So those are the kind of Samskara said a Kamakura new Buddhist school is like a, a coming out. It's a kind of very exciting time in that the end of medieval time and Kamakura time. So Honen was that time. Huh? The Honen Shonin uh, was a, uh, I would say, elite, <laughs> elite, a uh, Pure Land uh, Buddhist monk. He never married, never. <laughs> and then uh, he had a, he went, he went to uh, Mount Hie, just like Shinran Shonin went. He spent years and years and years, and then he had a very trouble. He had all the practices, but he went more farther down and going to more deep uh, uh, area in the Mount Hiei, uh, Kurodani, and then he went to, he stayed in Kurodani library. <laughs> he went, they say, they, he read all the sutras, Isaikyo, five times five times, looking for some way, even the ordinary people will be liberated. What is that? So he finally found a wonderful verse that was a, a Shantao's a, a Muryōjūkyō, ne? Muryōjūkyō uh, interpretation. And then also uh, he realized that a um, Amida's uh, soteriology is a uh, great compassion and wisdom. And he found it, and he found the great passages written by uh, Shantao. So he proposed a possible uh, deliverance and possibility of women to get enlightened and attain the Buddhahood. So women's spiritual liberation through their recitation of Nembutsu, Namo Ami Dabutsu. 
So Hon in Shunin, as I said, he was an elite uh, Kyoran Buddhist uh, monk and priest, and he recited Namo Amidabutsu, I don't know, 60 times, 60,000, sometimes 70,000 a day, day and night. Even you are walking, even you are sleeping, you are sitting, you decide, recite Namo Amitabutsu. He really focused the recit recitation, calling the name Namo Amitabutsu. And then also he based on the 35th bow in the larger sutra. Again, is he also based on the gender transformation as well, based on the 20, uh, 20, 35th uh, vow. So this is him. I think he is good looking man, don't you think? <laughs> nice looking, right. And then he wear the uh, very uh, nice robe, black robe, and then have ojuzu, juzu right here, nenju right here, always, right? And then this is his school, Yoshimizu So-an. Yoshimizu is a name or location in Kyoto, East Mountain, Higashiyama. So after he descended from Mount Hiei, he had a school in Yoshimizu. We call it Yoshimizu School or Yoshimizu So-an. I went there a couple of times very quiet, very nice. I recommend when you go to maybe 2023, are you planning to go to Kyoto and 850 Shinran Shonin's in memorial and then establishment Jodo Shinshu, Rikkyo Kaishu, uh, or you're planning to go to uh, Kyoto, May, so you may go to. So while you're staying in Kyoto, you can visit a Honen Shonin's Yoshimizu School. It's just not far away from Honganji, very near by bus, or maybe you are able to walk. Okay? So let me show you. This is how Honen Shonin's uh, Yoshimizu School. Honen Shonin Dharma Gathering in Yoshimizu. See that picture right here? This is a kind of nice uh, uh, painting. So this is a Honin Shonin sitting, and then all the, those are ordained monks because they wear the robe, right? And it looks like this is sort of a, a woman, nun, there too. Maybe this is maybe a Shinisama. I don't know. Maybe one of them is a Shinran Shonin. Could be. And then look at that. Those are, looks like aristocratic people. Uh, some of the people has a samurai. Uh, they have a sword, looks like. And then there are some a merchants, farmers. And then look at all the women here, coming here, one after another. Old and young, men and women, all the job occupations, doesn't matter. They call, and then they came, and then they listened to Honen Shonin's Japanese Pyodan teaching, basically Amida Buddha's teaching, and great a vow to telling them everybody will be spiritually liberated. All you have to do is just hear Ramira is calling to you. It's coming to you. You have to hear with open mind and heart. Accept it and observe it. And then Buddha coming from your mouth. Namo Amidabutsu. That's what he was saying. Very easy. Because too easy, some of the people got a little confused particularly people on the mountain here doing a very severe practice, they said, that's not fair. <laughs> we all practice day and night. 
Yeah, some people really criticized the Honen and Shinran, right? That's why there was a big uh, persecution, number two. 1207, Honen Shinran got exiled from Japan, right? They went through a hard time, but they never gave up. Shinran said, well, I'll leave Kyoto, but this is a wonderful opportunity. I go to Ichigo, and now I have an excellent opportunity to share the Buddha Dharma with people in Ichigo, northern Japan, with Ishini. Very positive. That's what the Jodo Shinshu. Even we have a against wind, we can make it tailwind. That's a transformation, right? Isn't that powerful? Amida Buddha's vow, and we receive it through Namo Amida Butsu. So, this is a Honen Shonin school. Now, I want to talk about our founder Shinan Shonin. How Shinan Shonin thought about women's Buddhahood, right? But you remember, important thing is Shinran Shonin married to a Shinji Sama. Huh. Publicly, he made an announcement. I met the woman, Ishinji, and I love her. I mean, marry her. She, he made an announcement. At that time, I'm sure a lot of Buddhist ordained monks had a, a relationship with women, <laughs> not official marriage, but they have family, but they didn't really disclose it. That's what happened, because that was precept that uh, Buddhist monks are not supposed to marry. That's the precept. But the Shinran broke it. Why? Because, I want to tell you, because, you know, Shinran spent about 20 years in, on Mount Hiei. Nine years, nine years, a very small kid, he got ordained as a Tendai monk, right? After that, he went through all the practices. 90 day, Zogyo Zanmai, standing and uh, you know, 90 days on all around and seeing Amida Buddha around the circumambulating that Amida Buddha's va, you know, the statue, day and night, he did, and try to see the Buddha. He might do a thousand practice, Senjichi Kaiyo. He might have done it. I think he did it. Some scholars say he did it. But he had a problem to see a Buddha, Kenbutsu. Didn't happen. So, he had a serious problem. So he decided, going down from Mount Hiei, and then he started going to Rokkakudo. Rokkakudo. Rokkakudo is this temple right here. And when you see Rokkakudo on top, this is how the roof looks like. Rokkaku means uh, hexagonal. Rokkaku, hexagonal. See the roof is hexagonal? So this temple is still there in Kyoto. Actually, it's still located the same original spot in center of Kyoto. I tell you, it's right next to Starbucks. <laughs> so, as it's a shopping center area, that temple is here. But way back to Shinran's time, Shinran was born 1173, huh? past 1263. When Shinran was 29, 30, he descended from Mount Hiei. He started going to this uh, Rokkakudo. 
he decided, I'm going to go to Rokkakuto, and then、uh, this is going to be a hundred day visitation. Every day, even rain, rainy day, even stormy day, even so burning hot day, he went every day. And finally, 95th day, he had a dream. He had a dream. That's what a s h i n i s letter s a y I will talk about the s h i n i s letter later. So, what kind of dream he had? By the way, I have to tell you that the dream, you know,、uh, even I have a dream, I never remember. <laughs> Do you remember dream? I sometimes have a dream just before I woke up, I think. But I don't remember normally. Not at all. But those people in medieval time, dream means a lot. Kind of、uh, when they have a dream, they believe, oh, this is sort of like a,、uh, what would happen to me in the future. They seriously took. A dream. So, because no, at that time there was a no movie entertainment, there is no YouTube to watch, there is no Instagram, <laughs> there is a SNS, there is no email at all, right? That's only kind of a little bit mysterious thing. Ah, I had this dream. This will happen to me. That's what the people thought about in medieval time. So, let me tell you Shinran's dream in Rokkakudo. So, this is the uh, uh, image. This is the Shinran Shonin. He's sitting there inside of Rokkakudo. And then they say this is a Avaroke Teshavara. Avaroke Teshavara. Is a kano. One of the words in Chinese they call it kuan yin. Avaroke Teshavara showed up. This is how Shinran's、uh, dream g o So, this Avaroke Teshavara is a little bit funny because normally Avaroke Teshavara has some kind of uh, uh, beautiful uh, ornament on top of head. But this one doesn't. And then doesn't have so much a,、uh, elegant attire, more like a white robe. That's a very interesting image to me. But anyway, they say this is Avaroke Teshavara. So this Avaroke Teshavara said if the believer, because of a fruition of karma, is dream by sexual desire, Then I will take on the body of a beautiful woman to be ravished by him. Throughout his entire life, I shall adorn him well, and at death, I shall lead him to birth in the pure land. That's what this Avaroke Teshava told. Shinran Shonin in his dream in Rokkakudo. How do you think? So, evidently, this a v a r k e t e s h e v a telling him if you want to marry me, I will be your wife, I will be your partner, and I will take care of you, make sure. And、uh, I will lead you to the birth in the pure land. So, when Shimran was woke up, Shimran was at, probably at that time is 29, 30 years old. He thought, What a dream I had. Well, probably I assume, this is my assumption though. At that time already, Shinran might have met 
It is shiny already in Honen school. Probably. And then, kind of my imaginary. <laughs> she ran sort of like that. fell in love. Maybe pay attention of Eshini. But he knew that I'm not, so, I'm not supposed to marry because I'm a Buddhist monk. He was fighting within himself. But after the, this dream he, you know, had, he immediately went to Honen school. And then he talked to Honen. My teacher, Honen, can I tell you the dream I had at Rokkakudo, this story? How do you think? You think I can marry? I really like Ishini. Honen said, well, if marriage help you to pursue Amida Buddha's teaching and then Nembutsu life, go ahead. Marriage is not going to hindrance for your Buddhist monk career. Go ahead. But if the marriage bothers you, you shouldn't. So, you make a decision. So, Jiren decided, okay, I will marry Eshini. So she, he publicly made an announcement and then he married Eshini. And then Eshini and Shiran, after the Nembutsu persecution, they left Kyoto and then exiled to Ichigo, right? Ichigo. But luckily, the Eshini's father was there, Ichigo, and then probably they had a financial support and they were able to live in that Ichigo area. So I assume the Japanese eh, at that time is emperor or court decision uh, is not entirely severe. They must have considered that uh, Shinran's wife, father is Ichigo. So if they got exiled there, they are not going to be starving to death. They can get a probably uh, financial support. Probably that will happen. Okay, so this is it. Shinran's uh, dream in Lokakudo. In the story uh, of marriage of uh, Eshini. So, just briefly uh, talking about a, uh, Shinran's view of a woman's birth in Pure Land. Uh, this is Wasam, Hymns of the Jodo. Uh, Pure Land. Uh, I don't know if you have a collective works of Shinran. I don't. It's okay. I just uh, if you don't have it, that's fine. Uh, let me read that. This these two um, hymns or wasan and expressed Shinran's a view of a woman's birth in Pure Land. Number one is so profound is Amida's great compassion that manifesting manifesting inconceivable. Buddha wisdom. The Buddha established the vow of transformation into man. That is 35th vow. They are both voting, vowing that an, 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 able, an, an able woman to attain Buddhahood. Okay. Next one. If the woman did not entrust themselves in Amida's name and vow, they would never become free of the five obstructions. Even though they passed through the myriads of corpus, how then could the existence as a woman be transferred, transformed? 
So those are the two uh, Shinran's wasan, uh, focusing the woman's uh, liberation. Again, as he is still based on the 35th vow, that uh, transformation, physical transformation uh, idea and concept. I just want to share uh, what he thought about and then about a woman's a, uh, attaining the Buddhahood. He doesn't uh, negate 100%. He welcomed women because he married to a Shinri, and I'm sure that Shinran Shonin taught the Amida's vow to a Shinri, Kakushinni, every day. Okay? So, Let's get into Shinni-sama. Shinni-sama, as you know, I'm sure your temple have a Shinni-sama memorial service. Do you? And then BWA uh, ladies, a uh, past ladies memorial service together, maybe. Uh, so she, she was born uh, 1182. She's a little bit younger than Shinran Shonin and passed away 1268. So, Shinni married to Shinran. Shinni was a great woman. I would say Shinni is the first Shin Buddhist woman, I think. So, uh, and then also, she saved Shinran by leaving a Shinni's letter, uh, which is called a Shinni Shosoku, a Shinni's letter. A Shinni's letter is sort of like a she was, a, a she means a Shinni, was corresponding with her youngest daughter, uh, Kaku Shinni. What happened is after uh, a Shinni spent a life with Shinran Shonin in Echigo, northern Japan, and then they came down to uh, Ibaraki, a Kanto area. And then they spread the Dharma and then Nembutsu teaching. And then Shinran, probably that mid 60 or so, he decides to return to his a hometown, Kyoto, because he wanted to finish the Kyogyo Shinsho, his writing. To do so, he wants to see a various sutras. He couldn't find any big library type thing in Kanto, Tokyo area at that time. Everything was in Kyoto. Kyoto was the capital, a thousand years. So he wanted to go to Japan, Kyoto, return to Kyoto, and then rewrite a edit, a Kyogyo Shinsho. That was the reason he decides to go back to Kyoto, his own town. But Eshini, he, some of the scholars say Eshini also accompanied to Shinran, to Kyoto, stayed there a couple years, but Eshini told Shinran, you know what, I have to go back to Ichigo because I have a land uh, heritage from my father and he, I have a many workers, so I have to go back to my uh, town to take care of the business. So Eshini left Kyoto, sort of Eshini left Shinran. It doesn't mean it's not divorce, <laughs> just like a reason. And he, she left Kyoto and went, went back to her own city, uh, Ichigo. I think Shinran was, uh, Eshinni was very independent to me. I like her. She knows what to do, and then she wants to do. So she's very active, and then, uh, you know, she went back to her hometown. That's why she's up there in Echigo, but however, uh, uh, Kakushinni, the youngest daughter, was with her father, Shinran. So Kakushinni was taking care of 
father、uh, Shinran Shunin until he died, taking care of a caretaker, caregiver. So,、uh, mother Eshinni and then Kakushinni in Kyoto, they write a letter back and forth, back and forth. Again, There is no email at that time, no line, no text. So they have to write a letter, somebody has to deliver it, and then respond. I don't know, it's just month and month, back and forth, back and forth. So those letters still exist. So what happened is, About maybe that、uh, 1920 or 21, there was a big debate about a Buddhist scholars in Japan and talking about did really Shinran exist? <laughs> well, Shinran Shonin changed his name many, many times. So to them, to the scholars, said, there is no evidence at all. To make sure the existence, to prove that Shinran's、uh, existence. So,、uh, evidently, there was a big problem in the entire Honganji. But, however, luckily,、uh, one of that a,、um, minister,、uh, Washio Kyodo Sensei,、uh, found a, a Shinni's letter in the Nishi Honganji's archive room. There was some kind of like a roll scroll. And I'm sure there's tons of other things still now they haven't touched. But Washio Sensei found this. What is this? And then he opened it. And that's the actual, original Ishini's letter responding with. Her、uh, Doro Kakushini. So, this is it. This letter says, so it's right here, concerning the birth of my husband, Shinran. That's what the Ishini says, Ishini Sama says in her letter, concerning the birth of my husband, Shinran, in the Pure Land. Nothing whatsoever needs to be said anew because that's the time Kakushinni wrote a letter to Eshinni. You know what? My dad, your husband just passed away. So Eshinni is writing and responding to her. Long ago, when he, means Shinran, left Mount Hiei, he, Shinran, secluded himself. For hundred days of Rokkakudo to pay concerning his next life at dawn on the 95th day, Shotoku Taishi appeared in the revelation and composed a verse for him. Shino went to see Honen for another hundred days. There is only one path leading out of Safsara in the next life for the good. And evil persons alike. That's what Eshinyu said in one of her letters. Letter consists of 10 different letters, but this is one of the letters Eshinyu said, responding to Kakushinyu. So, see, already my husband Shinran was in that Mount Hiei. He was a doso, right? So, this is a proof Shinran did. Exist. So, you see, Eshinyi proved the husband Shinran's existence, real existence. Without it, I don't know what could have happened. And then also, he she said, I'm one who believes that I would ever to along with him. Since from realm to realm, from rebirth to rebirth, I am lost already. But I will go and to see him. Don't you think it's so certain? There is even, not even a doubt 
about 20th, I mean, 35th vowel. She doesn't even say, I have to transform my life and body and physical form to man. No. She said, I will surely and along with him, I will see my husband. This is very deep belief. And as Shinran taught this teaching to Ishini, I think. Move on. Now is Kakushini, his daughter, at 1224. Kakushini is a founder of Honganji and then establishment of Rusu Shiki caretaker system. I know as probably some of the people don't know those words, but don't worry about it. I will explain to you. <laughs> Kakushini is she's a lady here. She's the youngest daughter. Okay, and they have about uh, Kakushini and Shinran Shioni. He had his six children, maybe seven. Okay, but uh, Kakushini is the youngest one. Okay. So as I said, Kakushini was a uh, deathbed and then actually with another brother. And then when Shinran Shonin passed away in Kyoto, Kakushini was right next to him. So Kakushini made a very simple Shinran Shonin's grave. Like this is the first grave. It was made in uh, Toribeno, Toribeno, very simple, fence and everything. But Kakushini, first husband name is Hino, Hino, uh, uh, Hirotsuna. And then between Hirotsuna, uh, she had a, a son, uh, Kakue, uh, and then uh, Kogyokuni, the daughter, but Hino, uh, Hino uh, Mr. Hino, I would say, or Hirotsuna, the first husband, passed away right after the second child uh, was born. So um, Kakushini uh, remarried uh, to uh, Onodera, Zennen, Zennen Onodera. So Zennen Onodera, uh, had a, uh, owned a huge land in Higashiyama, uh, east mountain area in Kyoto. So uh, Onodera Zennen as well, uh, after he passed away, or before he passed away, he gave a uh, the land to Kakushini. Kakushini inherited a land from her second husband. So after Shinran passed away, she um, used, or she made a better grave, grave building or grave in that land she received from Zennen Onodera. This is what it is. See right here. So again is hexagonal, roof is hexagonal, and so right here is Shinran Shonin statue inside here. And then this a uh, this place became a Otani Hombyo, Otani Mausoleum now. Again, you might go there next year, 2023. Okay? So those are the things. So Kakushini, don't you think? Uh, he, he, she inherited the land from the second husband and then made a gravesite, and now he, it became an Otani Hombyo. It's the Otani Hombyo is now the Shinran Shonin's gravesite there. And a lot of people wants to be uh, buried there or no kotsudo there, right? So uh, Kakushini donated that land to uh, Shin Buddhist uh, community. So, so that means this uh, Otani Hombyo now is a landmark for all the Shin Buddhist uh, Sangha members, not in Japan, all over Japan.
all over the world. In here is a mausoleum. We have overseas a uh, no kotsudo as well. BCA no kotsudo. Sometimes when I go to Japan, I visit them. Right. So this is very very uh, important place. So Kakushini, thank you Kakushini. She made a honganji, and then she made a, uh, a otani mausoleum. And then she established a rusushiki system. That means caretaker. Caretaker means uh, the person who takes care of this mausoleum. Uh, that evidently, that's a gomonshu system, honganji gomonshu system. Now it's 25th gomonshu sama, senyo gomonshu sama from the shinran shonin sama. Right? So those are the coming down. This is a Gomonshu system, a traditionally called a Lusu Shiki caretaker system. That's what the Kakushini established. And then Kakushini, after her, she gave a caretaker a position to her son, Kakue. Kakue was the first son with the first husband, not the second husband. To me, kind of interesting. She got a land from the second husband, but however, she nominated and she chose and selected the Kakue. Uh, he has, he was a, he was a son between uh, Kakushini and first husband, not the second husband who gave her the land. That's the way she is. So, my impression about Kakushini, if she's alive here now, she will be a quite businesswoman. <laughs> she chose the right person, and then she knows how to run that uh, community. Okay? That's those are the contributions that a, a mother, uh, Eshini and daughter Kakushini went through. All right, I'm running out of time, I'm sorry. And then now, I'm gonna talk about a little bit from the medieval time uh, to the Edo period. Edo period started 1600, before the major restoration, as the 1868. As Edo time is very easy and no wars and a lot of cultures popped up. So there is a famous Myokonin Den. It's a stories of wondrous believers or stories of Shin Buddhist Nembutsu people. Myo means rare and Ko means wondrous and Nin is person and Den is a story. So the term, you know, Myokonin became more prominent in the Edo period. With the production of Myokonin Den, this is a story of those people, a collection of bio uh, biographies of the Shin Buddhist. Those stories are about the ordinary people, such as farmers, merchants, uh, or samurai, uh, describing their simple religious confession. Uh, so a lot of people, like you might hear that Genza, Shoma, and Saichi, and Okaru. So I want to briefly talk about Okaru. Okaru is a woman, Myokoni. Okaru was born in uh, Yamaguchi, Shimonoseki. And some of the people that your ancestor came from, you know, Yamaguchi maybe. So uh, she married to a uh, nice man, age of 19, and her husband is 28. Uh, the marriage life was okay, but after a couple years, husband started having an affair uh, with other women. So Okaru got really upset and became mad and jealous. So. She came to the temple. Temple name is uh, Saikyoji, 
and this uh, uh, Gendo, uh, Reverend Gendo, and then she complained, you know what happened? My husband had a affair. I, I cannot really, uh, you know, um, forgive him at all. What's going on? I don't understand the life is. That's not fair. Da -da 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 -da. And then this minister said, Okaru, just come back tomorrow. Listen to the Dharma every day. You will know. So she came every day. She went to the temple every day and listened to the Dharma. And then finally, this minister said, You know, good thing you, it happened to you. Good thing your husband had an affair. <laughs> now, Okaru, you come to the temple every day. And then now, I understand your appreciation in Dharma is deeper and deeper and deeper every day. Don't you think? At that time, Okaru is kind of became calm and then understand cause and conditions and then sort of he went back to her husband and starting having a wonderful family. That's what goes. So this is Okaru family in the story is a, uh, another Mukoni. There is some, some other women Mukoni, but I don't want to make it long. So uh, move into a uh, uh, modern time a little bit. I'm going to talk about a uh, <clears throat> Lady Takeko Kujo, right? Uh, Lady Takeko Kujo, I'm sure a lot of women know and in beautiful lady Takeko is a uh, founder of a Buddhist Women Association. Takeko was born 1887, founder of BWA. After she was a daughter of that uh, second daughter of a um, 21st Gomonshu Sama, Myonyo Shonin, and his wife Fujiko Sama, Ryodo Shinshu Honganji Ha. Buddhist organization in Kyoto, Japan. So 1904, Takeko helped Kazuko. Kazuko is a sister-in-law. So uh, Takeko's brother uh, will become a 22nd Monshu, uh, Monshu Kozui-sama, okay? So uh, Kozui's uh, wife name is Kazuko. So Takeko helped Kazuko uh, to form the BWA. So 1907, uh, in Japan, the BWA headquarters was established. And then 1911, Kazuko became a, uh, no, 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 uh, Takeko. Takeko became a BWA president. What happened is a, after um, Kazuko came back from Europe trip. She suddenly passed away at the age of very young. So uh, Kazuko's dream uh, to have an established BWA, uh, she was supposed to be a head or a chairperson. But however, after she passed away, and Takeko has to take over and then um, proceed a, a sister-in-law's dream to establish the BWA. That's what she did. So Takeko became a BWA president. And then 1920, um, Takeko uh, established the Kyoto Joshi Senmongako, a kind of a Kyoto girls high school. And then uh, also that uh, later on became a current Kyoto Women's University, which I graduated and my mother went there too. So in 1923, as you know, is a, there was a big earthquake and great Kanto earthquake. So she devoted and worked on the social affair activities very hard. And then also we shouldn't forget, she was very talented. She was a very good writer. She wrote a beautiful haiku, poems, essays, 
Her calligraphy is beautiful, her painting, very artist. So she published the collection of her poems or essays, which is called Muyuge. Muyuge. So um, this English translation recently came out. We named it as Leaves of My Heart. Leaves of My Heart. And then 20, in 1927, she made a, a quite a lot of royalties. And then she was able to help the needy people, uh, victims from great Kanto earthquake. And then also she planned to uh, build a Asoka hospital in Tokyo by using these royalties. So Asoka hospital in Tokyo is still now. It was established after she passed away, 1928. So Takeko had a very short life, probably 42 years or so, very short life. But what she did is such a tremendous uh, work. And I wonder why she was such an energy. What moved her? Huh. She was married. Of course she married. Oh, I have to show you the picture. Look at this. I'm sorry. I forgot about this. On your left side is standing is a, a sister-in-law, uh, Kazuko. She passed it after she came back from Europe. I told you that. And sitting is a uh, uh, Takeko. Uh, at that time, they were wearing the Western dress. It's this uh, kind of uh, uh, beginning of uh, Meiji Restoration. A lot of Western culture came. You know, instead of kimono, people wear a Western dress, very nice dress. So that's the photo shows. And then another uh, photo so shows like providing the clothing and food and place to stay and victim is a great uh, Kanto earthquake, 1923. So um, Takeko is giving all that um, dress and kimono and everything, and sometimes blanket, food, you know, to those people. Okay, so I was luckily uh, 19, 2019, uh, there was a, uh, a 16th World Buddhist Women Conference in San Francisco. Uh, I'm sure some of the people went there. I went there too. So uh, my sangha gave me this uh, uh, wagesa. It's just uh, this is San Francisco, uh, 16th WBWC uh, commemorative uh, orchestra. Uh, California poppy here, and you can see that a, a golden bridge design, uh, beautiful. So I wear this one today. Uh, yeah. So. Um, and then I was talking about uh, Muyuge. Uh, we just published this, uh, this Leaves of the Heart. Uh, this is the newest English translation of uh, Lady Kujo Takeko's uh, uh, essays and poems. Uh, it came out in 2018. Uh, publishers is uh, American Buddhist Study Center, and the main uh, translator is a uh, uh, Wayne Yokoyama, and then I worked with him as well, and then uh, Hoshina uh, Seki, uh, and then Edith. Uh, we all worked together, and I want to thank you, Hoshina, to publish this wonderful book, uh, English translation. So in there, um, briefly, I want to um, just. To Share that a uh, the Takeko's a uh, uh, talking about uh, essay, a gasho from the heart. Uh, trapped in a world of chaotic change, we seek an eternal, unchanging existence. There is nothing to rely on this fleeting world, 
Everything here is transient. There is nothing a thing to be proud of in this worldly life where our karma conditions dictate that we spend our lives chasing after illusions. Thirdly, we try to hide our spiritual poverty by wrapping ourselves in a finally of grand illusions. Exhausted, we must walk a dark path of suffering that stretching, stretches uh, endless into distance. How sorry I feel for those people caught in this state. And then, but when we open, openly lament the way we are, when we humbly place our hands in gusho from the heart, we will clearly see the bring torch raised high for lost and deluded seekers to gaze upon. Though your august presence is unseen, though your noble voice is unheard, there is the dimension that I alone know, where our, your vow is ever working, where your light is ever shining. As I kneel with hands placed together without the shred of doubt, I joyfully receive you with this gusho from my heart. I think it's a beautiful essay she shared with me. So move on. After that, Takeko, I want to talk uh, briefly about awakening of contemporary Shimbolist women. There are four women. I'm sure there are a lot. I'm sure there are. They also, you also have a wonderful Shimbolist woman, Buddhist woman at your temple. And your mother too, your sister too, you know. But four women I selected, those are all Shimbolist women. So first of all, I want to say Hisako Nakamura. Hisako Nakamura. By the way, this is a beautiful Momiji garden. Eikando Kyoto. Eikando is a beautiful temple. And then if you go there, if you're lucky, you can see the Amida statue. Very small. But Amida is turning like this. Mikaeri Amida. Amida is not facing to you. Amida is turning to you like this. Yeah. Make sure you are following me. Make sure. Huh. I think that really expresses Amida Buddha's tremendous compassion to all sentient beings. So, Ekando is turning Amida Buddha statue. Mikaeri Amida Buddha. Don't miss it out when you go to Kyoto. Okay? So now, going to Hisako Nakamura. Hisako Nakamura is another book right here. We call it The Hands and Feet of the Heart, Hisako Nakamura. That's available, maybe that the BCA bookstore, I think. So Hisako, look at that. She was born in Nagano. I think. And then uh, she had a, um, you know, it's just a, her living town is very cold, gets cold in the winter time. And then she had a frost bite when she was a child, maybe three, four years old. She got frost bite. So the frost bite became a gangrene. So, um, yeah, Toyama, Toyama, Takaoka, Tokao, Takaoka, Gifu Prefecture, Prefecture. I said Nagano, but Gifu Prefecture. Uh, Takayama, Takayama is a mountainside. So the winter time is freezing to death. There is no, no heater, nothing. They are poor. So he, she got a frostbite, and then that became a gangrene. So. Um, Unfortunately, she has to amputate that uh, both hands and both feet. Can you believe? 
can you imagine? You know, lo losing those both hands and both feet. She had a tremendous life experience. Well, but her mother and grandmother were very strict. Well, tried to be strict to her. And then tried to educate how to cook, how to eat, how to sew, how to do uh, calligraphy, writing, everything. So she was able to almost everything, just like other everybody, normal people can do. That's what it is. So the picture said she is knitting, maybe crochet, right? And then she is the uh, put that um, the you know the brush in her mouth, and then she was to a uh, viewing brush paint. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm sure she asked herself, she asked the Buddha, why this thing happened to me? That's not fair. I need my feet. I need my hand back. I'm sure he, she thought about it. But as she listened to the Buddha Dharma, deeply, deeply, she realized it, and she was able to accept it, the cause and condition, the way she is. So she left a beautiful poem, many, many poems, but one of the things I really like is, goes like that. Although I have no arms and legs, how peaceful the day is that I am being wrapped in the Buddha's sleeves. Te wa naku mo, ashi wa naku tomo mi hotoke no soba ni kurumaru mi wa yasuki kana. Isn't that wonderful? Ah. She accepted, she nodded, that's okay. This is the life I received. And then she deeply appreciated being wrapped in the Buddha's sleep. I think this is so beautiful. And then she wrote a calligraphy down there, is mushin, is egolessness. Egolessness. It's difficult, huh? I have an ego. Yeah, I always think about, you know, about myself. Egoistic thinking. It's very hard to get rid of it. But I have to keep in mind. Egolessness. Even I'm not perfect. Keep in mind. I'll keep in mind. I will do my best. Egolessness. After that, Akiko Suzuki, maybe you might have heard her, maybe not. Uh, she was a Higashi Honganji's minister's wife, uh, Bomori-san. Maybe you don't call Bomori anymore. <laughs> this is minister's wife uh, in Hokkaido. So uh, her Higashi Honganji had a kindergarten so she was a teacher. I think she was a principal of a, a, a kindergarten. Uh, she was a wonderful lady, and she was born 1941. But uh, after 40, she got the diagnosis of uh, uh, breast cancer. And then she went through a uh, lot of treatment. And unfortunately, she left this world and departed to uh, Amida's Pure Land. So she wrote a uh, lot of poems again. And then after her death, and then it came out, this kind of book, and Gan Kokuchi no Atode, means the uh, after cancer diagnosis. Again, there's a lot of beautiful, uh, very touching, um, the poems. Uh, since she 
Probably she was born in temple family and married to uh, uh, Higashi Honganji minister, I believe. But you know, uh, her understanding and appreciation in that uh, uh, Buddha Dharma and then Amida Buddha's teaching is as her problems going by more, more you know, serious, going through the tremendous uh, uh, treatment, and she's getting weak. And she senses it, my death is coming, right? But again, she still appreciates the life she receives every day. So let me share the poem she left. I am your mother. She had four children, OK? Shinsuke, Daisuke. Keisuke and Maya, I'm your mother forever. I will become Buddha in the Pure Land, but will always guide you. I love Shinsuke, I love Daisuke, I love Keisuke, I love Maya, and I love my husband. Another one, right side underneath this poem. This was, the title is uh, Life and Death. I uh, sort of uh, translated, and my translation may be not perfect, but when I awaken to the reality of my own death, the fact of living suddenly becomes vivid. Life and death, those two opposites, become one and bring me to the wondrous peace. In Japanese, it's a shoji. Shito yu mono o jikaku shitara. Seito yu mono ga yori tsuyoku fujo shite kita. Ai han suru mono ga yugo shite yawarageru fushigisa. How do you think about it? Huh. Okay. Two more ladies I want to say. This is a Shiono Sasaki. <laughs> she is a Nisei lady in uh, <clears throat> Kona Island. Uh, this story is in this book. It's a Dharma treasure uh, published by uh, <clears throat> Hawaii, a Honganji mission of Hawaii. Uh, I really appreciate Emuneto Sensei to publish this book. And then uh, uh, Chiyo no Sasaki is one of that uh, features here. There's a lot of uh, uh, Shin Buddhist uh, people, uh, not only ladies and all that uh, male and everybody's uh, story here. And then Chiyo no uh, was the second uh, uh, Nisei lady and born in Nakona Island. And then, um, she was a Shin Buddhist lady. And then uh, she worked on that corner of coffee farm all day long with her husband and then raised in 10 children. In order to attain the, some the resolution of a problem, and she turned into other religious religions, but she detested any compromise with a religion, religion that was idealistic. So she started going to Shin Temple and then listen to the Dharma. And every day, Chiyono went to the temple. And then uh, one day, uh, afternoon, and Chiyono returned home and from temple, and her husband, Kumataro, asked her, oh, Chiyono, uh, you are going to, uh, we always go to temple. For what? Chiyono said, well, to listen. So. Kumatero said, after listen, what did you learn? Tell me. Chiyono said, hmm, can I answer her? And finally said, nothing. Her husband, Kumatero said, what a fool you are. Hearing those words, something flashed across Chiyono's inner being. And she said, oh, today I finally
finally am able to truly listen. Yes, I am able to accept and embrace my foolish self. So Chiono's case is Chiono, every time she goes to, she went to the temple, probably she was ready to go, I have to listen to something, I have to grab something. Uh -uh -uh. But she realized it. I don't have to look for it. Buddha Dharma or Amida Buddha's eh, perfect liberation is already reached me through the voice Namo Amida Butsu. So we don't have to do anything, just accept it. That's why she realized it. So when I went there, uh, Muneto Sensei allowed me to this. This is a Chiono's real notebook. I was very impressed, you know, and then it's kind of like a falling apart. And Chiono is a sec, you know, Nisei, so she can only write hiragana, her pen, you know, and then I just open little by little, little. And then she was like, wow, kono mama ga ureshu te atama ga sagaru. I'm going to explain this poem later, but she just wrote it. Oh, I thought, this is, she wrote, this is the original notebook. So I took a picture and then returned the original to Muneto Sensei. Though. Yeah. So, the wonderful poems she wrote, kono mama. Kono mama means, oh, I am accepted as I am by Chiyono. I am so happy about being as I am, but I naturally bow my head, being good or bad, I am what I am, being false or true, I'm what I am, having or not having, I am what I am, rain or shine, I am what I am, crying or laughing, I am what I am, being dissatisfied with what I am, how greedy can I be? Being as I am doesn't change, it cannot be changed. Only Oyasama, means Amida Buddha, affirms me, calling, come as you are, because of not knowing that I am as I am. I wander around lost and confused because the confusion because of compassion or oyasama is all embracing I am now contained within it oyasama is pleased and I am happy to living together with oyasama daily Every time I listen to Oyasama Amida Sama working for my for my sake, I feel ashamed and grateful. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. That's the Chiyono's poems. Lastly, I'm going to talk about one of the the great uh, Sangha, Lady. Her name is Sachi Ochiai. Sachi was born 1990, and then she lived 100 years, 100 years. I did a funeral, and she was a very nice woman, and then uh, she was a Nisei lady. She went to uh, internment camp, and every time, and every, um, you know, uh, Obon time comes, I remember Sachi. And then, because Sachi used to be a Dharma school teacher, and then Sachi is a great listener. She never misses the Sunday services <laughs> and then study classes. And she always sit in front of me and listen to my talk. And then one day, when I became a full-time minister in Orange County Buddhist Church in 2015, she came to my office and room, and then she, gave me her uh, yukata. And she said, Mutsumi-san, you wear this yukata and dance at the Obon festival. I said, 
Huh? It was such a sudden <laughs> offer. And then I lost my word, but I said, oh, thank you very much, and I accepted. And she said, make sure you wear this one and dance with the drama school teacher. To me, I was not interested in dancing at all. I was not even planning to put on the yukara at all. But I rethought about it. Well, Sachi gave me her own yukata, so I put it on, and I danced. And then I noticed it while I'm dancing. Nobody's watching me. <laughs> I thought, I'm not a good dancer. I shouldn't make a mistake. But nobody was watching me anyway. So I was able to put my ego aside. And then after dance, I really enjoyed it. I sort of got connected all the sangha, and I was able to become more close to Dharma school teachers as well. So I realized that's what Sachi wanted to tell me. She didn't tell me any word, no instruction. She said simply, Mutsumi-san, you wear this yukata and make sure you dance. So now I really appreciate Sachi's intention and I appreciate her unspoken message. Certainly she was one of the Dharma teacher and then guided me and then nurtured me to become a full-time kakyoshi here at Orange County Buddhist Church. So thank you very much everyone spoke so patiently to listen to me and I really appreciate it and then at this time this is a Join me guys show and then I will go back to the real, uh, the normal uh, view and then open up that uh, question and answer and discussion. Join me guys show please. Namo Amidabots, Namo Amidabots, Namo Amidabots, Namo Amidabots.